If you're newer to candle making, maybe you've been checking out all the Facebook groups or watching every YouTube video or Googling your butt off, but you just can't get over that first big snag. Well, it's at that moment that a lot of people realize there's a little bit more to this candle making game than it seems like. You could just melt wax, add fragrance, pour it into a jar and call it good, but there are more levels to this thing. So in today's episode, I'm going to break down six of the most common candle making pitfalls that beginners fall into and how to overcome them because I believe that this is what it takes to get to the next level and there's a lot of candle makers that end up quitting because of one or more of these reasons. So let's dive in. Now the first pitfall is not knowing how much fragrance oil to use. This is a super common question because you just don't know how much to use when you first start getting into it. Most wax can hold between 3% and 10%. Some even go as high as 12% of fragrance oil by weight. In fact, if you just need a quick rule of thumb, I suggest using one ounce of fragrance oil for every one pound of wax, or if you're using the metric system, that's 28 grams of fragrance oil for every 454 grams of wax. And if you don't want to do any math at all, just take your wax weight and multiply it by 0.0625. This will give you roughly 6% fragrance load, which most wax can handle. The other thing about fragrance oil is you have to measure by weight. And this means ounces or grams, but not fluid ounces. Fluid ounces is actually a measurement of volume. That's how much space something takes up. We're talking about weight. So you're going to need a kitchen scale something that can measure grams or something that can measure ounces. The last note I want to say about fragrance oil is that adding more fragrance oil does not necessarily give you a better hot throw. In fact, you can think of the candle as the delivery system for that scent and the fragrance oil as the fuel. Adding more fuel does not necessarily make it a stronger throw and can actually complicate a lot of things. The second pinfall I see a lot of candle makers fall into is using the exact same wick for every single scent and every single candle that they make. Now, this is a huge mistake because wicks are very specific. In fact, the wick plays the most important role in the candle. That is, it manages the balance of combustion with how much fuel comes up the wick and how it's burned at the top. It manages the temperature of the wax. It manages the melt pool. Now, fragrance oil impacts the wick in a few different ways. The first, it changes the composition of the blend. The second thing that matters about fragrance oil is its relationship with the wax. Not every fragrance oil works with every wax. Some websites will even tell you for soy wax, this fragrance oil works well, or for soy wax, this fragrance oil doesn't work well. So the relationship between the fragrance oil and the wax is something you really have to pay attention to. So why does this matter for wick size? Well, wicks need to accommodate both activities and just changing the fragrance oil a little bit can change exactly what you need for a wick by a significant amount. It can change the size. It can even change the series, the exact type of wick that you're using. So even if you build a successful candle with one wick, changing your fragrance oil load by more than 1% or just changing the fragrance oil at all means you should start completely over with your wick testing to figure out what works. The third pitfall that candle makers fall into is burning their candle before curing their candle. Now, Patience is one of the most important skill sets for a candle maker and curing is the one of the biggest reasons for that. Now, what is curing? Curing we've covered before, but curing is the act of the candle hardening up or cooling. And it doesn't just cool, it also spreads out that fragrance oil throughout the blend a little more evenly. Now, a lot of people will burn their candle like right away. Like I've done it too. I'm super excited for my candle and I burn it after a day, two days, three days. And it smells fine, but then a week later, it actually burns a little bit differently. And the reason is this. The longer you cure your candle, depending on the wax, the more thermal energy will be required from the wick to melt that wax. This matters because of safety, right? The temperature of the flame at the top of the wick is going to impact the rate at which that wax melts and the temperature it's going to get into. If you tried to burn a candle, six hours after you pour it, that wax is going to be super soft. It's going to melt really easy. You'll have a really deep melt pool and you may have temperatures that get far out of control for what safety testing requires. Now, just because you burn it after 24 hours or 72 hours and you get a strong scent throw doesn't mean that that candle is ready for the market. 
Curing is important because it makes sure that your wick is sized for what that candle will look like a week or two weeks after it's poured, not just what it looks like 24 hours after. And the difference can be substantial. With soy wax, you may be completely overwicked if you burn it in 24 hours. If you wait two weeks, you may find that that same wick is perfect. Or vice versa, you may find a wick that works well for you burning it after three days, but then a week later, that wick may be too small. It might not be burning enough, you may end up with tunneling. Now, we're gonna talk about testing in a little bit, but curing that period of time is really critical to get an honest look at what that candle's safety is gonna be, not just its performance. Remember, performance is secondary, safety is number one. And if you're curious about what I recommend for rough curing times for your wax types, this is a chart here, you can take a look, screenshot, whatever you need to do. Let's move on to the next one. So number four is using the wrong materials. The internet has tons of candle making tutorials and they're not all great. All right, some of them are recommending practices that are absolutely unsafe or they're cool, but they don't work in reality and i'm talking about materials that will clog your wick or be a fire hazard or actually put you at risk for your container exploding if things go really bad because some things are just not meant to handle the heat so i'm gonna run through a quick list but if you want to read more about things you shouldn't put in your candles check out the blog post i've linked below so crayons are cool they actually come from paraffin wax but they contain Pig, they're pigment based material and they will not burn at all. They will clog your wick. You may get a flame for a minute, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, but you're not gonna get four hours. You're not even gonna get eight hours. Some people are using plastic containers. Come on, that is absolutely not okay. Plastic will melt. Here's a list of a few things you shouldn't consider with candle making. Now there are a couple small exceptions and I've talked about that in a happy hour way back when, but otherwise, it's best, especially when you start out, to avoid some of these. And if nothing else, it's for insurance purposes. Your insurance company may not cover you if something goes sideways when you're off doing one of these Pinterest tutorials that include some of these questionable practices. So just exercise caution, look for safety, use your head, be smart. So this fifth point may be a little controversial. Some of you may agree, some of you may not. But what I'm suggesting is a pitfall is starting with too many supplies. Candle making is fun for exercising your creativity, but that same creativity can actually lead to frustration and burnout. And the problem is that a lot of people get attracted to all these cool new waxes. They get every single fragrance oil. They want to make a candle in every single container they see. And if you're just a hobbyist, if you're just making candles for fun, no big deal, right? Go ahead and do that. But if you're looking because you may be serious about starting a candle business one day or you want to build things at scale, going in with too many inputs can scramble your outputs. What I mean is this. If you have too many different combinations of things, it's hard to track your outcomes and figure out exactly why something is or isn't working. You get lucky on occasion and things work out. But when you have too many different waxes or you're trying out too many containers, you just don't get that consistency, those repetitions that allow you to really understand what your craft is doing. And the age old advice, kiss, keep it simple, stupid, is the best advice I can give you when you're first starting out. And that is choose one wax, right? Master that one wax, choose one vessel, just one vessel, one diameter, one material, and stick with that until you figure that out. When you can build that win, that's a foundation which you can take to understand how to move into other items, other fragrance oils, other waxes, other containers, because if you're not able to master one, then it's gonna be really hard to master that random combination of 30 different things. So keep it simple when you start out. Don't go crazy, just try to learn candle making, and then extend that out into the marketplace for your creativity at that time. Before I get into my last pitfall, I just wanna make a shout out. If you're a beginner, you're looking to learn how to make candles and you eventually wanna start a business, but you just need to figure out the hobby, the craft first, well, I couldn't recommend this more. My Soy Wax Candle Making Fundamentals course has been out for a few months now and it is awesome. 
I cover everything about container candles. We use soy wax as the main wax in the course, but the concepts apply to container candle making. And one of the best things to learn is the fundamentals of anything before you try to build a business on top of it. So if you're interested in that, check out the link below. Otherwise, let's get into the last point here. So number six is this, testing. Testing, testing, testing. The <laughs> most important part of candle making is testing. And the reason is that safety and performance cannot be understood until you burn it. A lot of people go around looking for the formula. Hey, just tell me how to make a candle. I want to do that. Well, I can tell you how to make a candle, but your process, your system, and your environment may be different than mine, which means you're going to have to make the candle and then test it. So after curing, you burn test this candle. Now, burn testing covers everything. Safety and performance. There's some confusion around wick testing, burn testing, safety testing, performance testing. Believe me, it's almost all the same thing. You should always start with a safety test. The safety test tells you what to do with your wick. There's a lot to testing. You can do all these hacks to try to test faster, but at the end of the day, the result is changing your wick or changing your fragrance oil. Now, it sounds simple, but it requires a lot of patience, a lot of due diligence, a lot of watching, a lot of note taking. So testing is, if you know how to test right, you're gonna be very successful at candle making because it will allow you to identify how your inputs affect your outputs. Ultimately, you want your candle to do two things. You want it to burn safely and you want it to perform well. And the second part is a little more subjective. We've talked about that before, but safety is objective. You can say whether or not your safety test passes the industry standard test or whatever other criteria you have for safety, but it's as simple as that, testing. So if you're a beginner and you're not sure what to do, just remember, you make your candle, you test it, you react. Make your candle, you test it, react. And eventually when you pass all of your tests, you're good to go. You can do whatever you want with that candle. That's all I have today. I hope you found something useful, likable, insightful. If, if you did, leave me a like. If you have any questions, leave me a comment and I will get to it when I can. Otherwise, I hope you make beautiful candles. I hope you have a great week and I'll see you in the next episode.